Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us again in this um, great uh, day. And, and today we are going to be talking about why do I need a special needs attorney and a special needs planner? It's a very good topic uh, with families like us that we have a loved one with a disability to start learning about the future and what is the, th the things that we need to put in place um, to help them. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, but before we start with our presentation, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Partner Research Network. Well, my name is Veronica Alvarez and I'm the Regional 13 Coordinator for Partner Research Network. So we are the Parent Training and Information Centers for Texas. We are the PTI for Texas. We are funded by the Department of Education, specifically the Office of Special Education, to provide free resources and training for parents of children with disabilities and youth with disabilities that we call themselves advocates. Our mission is to empower and support Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. So who we serve? As I mentioned, parents of children with disabilities, do with disabilities, from the ages of from zero to 26. So it's um, since birth to um, young adults. Where we serve in all the state of Texas, Partner Research Network was first funded in 1996, and now we have four projects serving families. I'm part of the team project in the red area, I'm in Austin. Our services are free and we offer parent workshops, youth workshops, webinars like this one, information and referrals, one-on-one -on -one technical assistant. We help a lot in our meetings, IEP clinic consultations. If you have questions about the documents, we can help. We do once a year a symposium. We also uh, do parent leadership training, youth leadership trainings, and we can help, help you access to social media resources. So for today, if you have a question, your camera is off, your microphone, microphone is off, but if you have a question, please type it in the chat box or in the Q&A and we will help you. Um, we will read your question and try to answer. If you, we don't have an answer, then we can email you or you can do a consultation with our presenters to talk more about your case. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded and we are going to share it uh, later on in our Facebook page and also in a consolidated planning group. They have a YouTube uh, channel that Alison is going to talk about that. So you are going to receive uh, at the end of the presentation a survey, it's an evaluation Please help us with us is three questions. And with that, we can provide feed, you can uh, help us provide feedback and improve and also report to a grant to continue giving, giving you this kind of webinar for free. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, we do not provide CEUs, but if you need a certificate of attendance, please type it in the, in the, in the chat box or send me an email and I'm, I'm going to be happy to do a certificate of attendance for you. So again, my name is Veronica Alvarez. Uh, I think Alison, okay, Alison, sorry. So again, uh, my, inform my information is in the chat box. Uh, you can see it there, uh, my email and phone number. So now we are going to start with the presentation. Uh, we have here Alison Chauvert. She's with the Consolidated Planning Group. She's a financial planner. She's a parent of children with disabilities. She has a lot of expertise helping families in the field, more than 25 years serving parents. So she's going to be talking about this important topic. And also we have Melissa Donovan. Um, she is a, a, an attorney of law and she's a certified, certified national elder law attorney. And she's in Austin, um, she's with Texas Trust Law. Um, and she, they, they are both going to talk about this important uh, topic today. So welcome guys. 
Thank you, Veronica, for having us. It's always a pleasure to be back with you. So we haven't done this topic in a while. This is a topic that Melissa and I like to do on why do you need a special needs financial planner as well as a special needs attorney. Um, so we're going to go deep and wide um, into that today on what role uh, we play, e each of us play, and, and kind of at the seat at the table when it comes to planning for your loved one with a disability. So as Veronica said, today is being recorded. Um, everyone is going to get a copy of today's slides uh, via email, so you don't have to take notes on everything uh, that you see here today. And also, um, we welcome your questions, so feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we go through uh, today. So um, Consolidated Planning Group, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We are not a law firm. We do not do legal work or legal documents. Um, uh, we help people plan for the future of a loved one with a disability, and we are an advisory and consulting firm. So we're going to get into the details of that just a little bit more. We help people set up protection plans, lifetime care plans, transition planning. We help set up ABLE accounts. We do a lot of advocacy. We do a lot of help with benefit planning as far as um, SSI and Medicaid, SSDI and Medicare. Um, knowing when and how to apply for those benefits and how to protect those benefits. So one of the things that Melissa and I always talk about, and you heard Veronica say this at the very beginning, is that she is a certified elder law attorney. So we believe in our heart of hearts that when you're working um, with a professional because your situation uh, with your loved one with a disability is specialized it's very um very specific to that individual it's really important that you work with a specialist and the the importance of that is to a make sure that your documents are appropriate and correct um your legal documents and b to make sure that you have money in the right buckets to preserve eligibility for um, state and federally funded programs so there's there's over 260,000 financial advisors. I don't know the number of attorneys, Melissa, but fewer than one tenth of a percent of financial advisors in the US have any background with special needs. So while your financial advisor um, may be, you know, very educated and, you know, have similar licenses to those that have a background with special needs, they may not have any background in special needs and it could really um, make a difference in the planning that you that you um, that you do. So tell us about. I don't even know how many attorneys. I've never even looked that up. Do you know that number, Melissa? So it's funny because most people would just tell you too many. Is my experience, but technically in Texas there are about one hundred and thirty thousand attorneys, licensed attorneys in the state of Texas, and I am one of only twenty nine as certified elder law attorneys. To put that number into perspective. Um, so I know I always tell people being a certified elder law attorney makes it sound like I just work with a certain subsection of people age-wise, um, but it really just means that, as you know, special needs planning is kind of my area of specialty, whether dealing with younger individuals or the elderly and the different programs of Medicaid and Social Security as well. So like you said, we love this topic. It's a group, it's a group effort all the time. So let's dive in. And, and I know um, I always just like to mention because um, Texas Trust Law Law was the WeWa law firm for, I don't even know, 40 years, a very long time. <laughs> um, and so sometimes um, I just like to mention that for people that knew um, of the WeWa law firm. So tell us about your disclaimer. I'm sorry, I know you have to do that. So we attorneys always have to make sure you understand. So when we're doing educational seminars like this, that's really what that disclaimer is saying. You understand. I am not providing legal advice to any particular individual in this seminar that is simply meant to be educational advice. And if there's something that anybody in this room needs to speak with an attorney about, you need to reach out to an attorney individually for true legal advice. Don't take anything we say or anything you see on YouTube from somebody, random person as legal advice. Legal advice is done in person, one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, in starting, you know, we kind of we're going to kind of bounce back and forth today on what we do and um, and, and what Melissa does a special needs financial advisors. Um, they they provide financial advice with special needs considerations factored in. 
And I always like to say that you guys are the paper. Uh, those legal documents, got to have them, super important, and we're the money. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that, uh, Melissa? Yeah, so I usually kind of start similarly in terms of what that difference is. Um, when we say, you know, attorneys are the paper and the financial advisors are the money, there's a little bit more. Um, you go to an attorney who's specialized in what we do for a reason. Um, this is not something that I think any attorney, even someone who doesn't do special needs planning, would say, yeah, you're fine just going to some online website to do your planning. Uh, I know a lot of even attorneys that focus in estate planning, board certified estate planning and probate attorneys, that they don't even risk it when it comes to special needs uh, because it is a pretty specialized area. Um, so you just want to be exceedingly careful careful and make sure you're talking to the right person because a lot of working with an attorney is technically more than just the paperwork that you sign. It's the counsel and the expertise that goes into knowing what that paperwork has to say and knowing how to spot your particular family's issues. Because just saying that any family has a child with special needs doesn't mean that your family is the same as another family as another family, um, you know, that your child is receiving the exact same benefits as someone else's child. So that all comes into the picture and figuring out, okay, what is the proper legal advice? And then as we said, you know, Allison, she comes in kind of clutch as they say, in terms of, you know, how much money are you gonna need and where are the best buckets to pull this money from to put the money into whatever vehicle from a legal perspective we're advising you to move forward with. Melissa, I always like to pause here and, and talk about do-it-yourself projects. We got a lot of smart people that we work with and do-it-yourself is a thing. Um, and I always just like to mention that when it comes to planning for a loved one with a disability, it is strongly against any recommendation of mine to do it yourself. There's some stuff you absolutely can't do yourself. Um, but it, I cannot stress the importance of working with a professional that is truly nuanced um, with special needs and it makes all of the difference. There are, there are places that do it yourself as a good thing, but this is not one area. It's too important and oftentimes, and I know you've seen this too, Melissa, where we've seen things that we did it ourselves or our brother, the real estate attorney or our neighbor you know, some other type of attorney was willing to do some things for us for free or a discounted price. And they ended up having to be completely redone because they were simply just wrong. And that is the why behind that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the last thing that you want to have to deal with is having to go back and fix something that you thought was fine. Like I tell people that all the time. Sometimes the worst part about having a do it yourself anything is that you think you're good until it's too late to realize that you're not. And then there's a lot of more work that has to go into fixing what was done in the first place than if it had been done right the first time. And I also think about um, not waiting until a crisis happens to find out things are wrong, because uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's the, the crisis. Somebody has died, somebody's had a stroke, somebody has um, become incapacitated. And now we realize that it wasn't exactly what we thought it was. And that's when it's a little bit late. And so do look at those things. And it's not, I, I would argue, you know, it's not about beating it yourself up because if you have any documents in place, then that's better than not having documents at all. Um, but it's important to look at them from, from, from time to time for sure and, and review those. So some of the things um, as an advisor uh, that, that we do, we are gonna provide financial advice. So when it comes to planning for a loved one with a disability, you know, it's a tall order. I often um, kind of refer, it, refer to it as, it's almost like a third bucket of, for retirement. So if you're married, husband and wife retired, if you're a single person, make it the second bucket. Um, because when we retire, we need our assets to last 25 to 35 years in retirement, which is a very long time and it's a tall order. But when we have a loved one with a disability and it's our child, they may live 25 to 35 years after we're gone. So that's why it's so critically important. Um, the sooner you get started when plan for planning, the better. So again, it's not about beating yourself up about what you haven't done. Um, it's about either A, picking up where you left off or getting started. 
um, because those years make a big difference. So when it comes to planning, it could be fee-based or commission-based. Um, a, a special needs planner is going to calculate future care cost estimates, and that sounds like a boring term, um, but it's the, it answers that question of how much money do I need to fund the special needs trust, the future care costs of my loved one. Um, we want to make sure that you have assets in the right buckets to protect public benefits um, and you know and we're namely talking about uh, SSI and Medicaid and then all states have Medicaid waivers which require Medicaid eligibility so when a person is getting Social Security disability it doesn't matter as much of your assets as long as you don't care about having Medicaid or a Medicaid waiver but what we find is that most families do want to keep Medicaid. They do want to stay eligible for Medicaid waivers, um, and some people are already getting them. Some people will be in the future that they'll be um, getting those, those waivers, but if you don't have money in the right buckets, then you simply won't qualify. The asset uh, requirement limit is still $2,000 in Texas. There are a few states that are different than the $2,000 limit, but as for Texas, it is going to be, um, it's still going to be that $2,000. Um, so um, we're able to look at your current ass assets and forecast ability to retire and pay for future care. Because the thing is, is when I think about planning for a loved one with a disability, I think for parents, this is the marathon, not the sprints. This is the long term. And for parents with kids with disabilities, our retirement might look a little bit different. We may not retire and sail off into the sunset in our motorhome or vacation all the time and travel all the time and things like that if you have caregiving responsibilities. So you want to have your retirement. I look at the parents first because we want you to be comfortable in retirement. We want you to have some semblance of the retirement that you hope for and that you work so hard for all of those years. And a financial advisor is going to provide the best advice on which financial vehicles will reach your goals. And, and that is from a, um, from a risk perspective, from a income perspective and kind of where we need to go in the future on the income needs once we do retire. And they'll help with those types of things. We have some questions in the Q&A. Uh, one of those says, does the attorney need to be in our county in Texas? Does the attorney need to be within your county? That mm -hmm. was the question. Yes. No, you can technically work with an attorney anywhere in the state of Texas. Now, depending upon the circumstances, sometimes it is in your best interest to have someone a little bit closer. Um, but technically for planning and things like that, you don't have to have someone right down the street. Um, and sometimes that's not a possibility because there are fewer people who focus in this area than if you know, you've got like a general, I'm, I, I got to sue someone because I was in a car accident type of situation. Um, so you just want to look at the best fit for you. And a good attorney, to be very frank with you, um, someone who is highly ethical, which in my opinion, every attorney should be, but we have TV shows and, you know, cliches for a reason. Um, and I'm very strongly of the opinion that if you talk to an attorney, a good attorney is going to tell you up front if they feel like you should work with someone different. I've, I've done that before with, with some clients and Allison can attest to that as well. I agree for sure. So some of the things that we'll help with are the transition planning, both special needs and life. And when I think about transition planning, transi transition is such a broad word in our community, um, whether you're thinking about transition of healthcare, transition of education, transition of living arrangements. There's so many pieces to the transition puzzle and we talk a lot about that we help up we help set up able accounts we have entire presentations on the consolidated planning group youtube channel um, regarding able accounts but an able account is a place that you can have money outside of that two thousand dollar medicaid limit that i was talking about that will not count against your loved one um, for ssi and medicaid purposes 
and Melissa is going to talk about another place that you can have money outside of outside of there as well. We do a lot of advocacy through resource sharing and referrals. We do a lot of advocacy by way of webinars. Um, we have over 400 webinars on our YouTube channel. And guys, they were born out of my own frustration. I am a parent to two adult kids with disabilities and I eat, sleep and breathe this. And I felt really frustrated about how difficult everything is when they turn 18 and you're transitioning into adulthood. So if you can think of a topic, it is out there on the YouTube channel. We've labeled them in such a manner so you can kind of search for the for the step that you're on in your planning journey. Um, but there's a lot of great information out there for free um, and a lot of um, webinars with attorneys. We've discussed guardianship and special needs trust and Medicaid waivers and SSI and Medicaid, you name it, it's out there. And then um, we're going to um, kind of do some discussion on appropriate funding sources for current and future care. Um, we do a lot of strategizing on SSI and Medicaid, SSDI and Medicare. We are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, um, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We have the only software out there that takes into consideration a disabled adult child under a parent's record for social security purposes. And what that means is that tells us as parents with a kid with a disability, exactly when and how to pull the trigger on social security to maximize benefits for the whole family, not just the disabled adult child. So I think we've kind of talked about what attorneys do a little bit earlier uh, versus you as an advisor. Um, but, but one thing I will say, kind of going back towards Allison a little bit, is I do get a lot of clients that will come in and will sit down and, you know, as going through things and we'll talk about, do we need a special needs trust? Do we not? Let's say we've got a 16, 17 year old child and we're starting to think about guardianship. Do we need guardianship? Can we do other things like supported decision making agreements and things of that nature? When we're having those conversations, a lot of times what I will say, Allison, is I do get a question from clients saying, well, how much, how much do I need? You know, and some people think, well, if my child is on Medicaid and SSI, maybe they need less. Other people think, well, I've got a special needs child and then I've got two other healthy children who are going to be able to provide. Uh, so I want to give most of my money to the special needs child. Those are questions that we are going to discuss with clients all the time, but we are going to typically defer to someone like Allison as a financial advisor, because that's what she does. And that's how those things kind of combine. You know, Allison is there to help figure out the numbers. How much do we need? Like she said, what are those future care costs going to look like, especially taking into consideration benefits that are going to be there? And then as we're having these conversations and we're interpreting the issues and we're going through and spotting the problems that we need to deal with for you, talking about special needs trust, talking about general estate planning, talking about, like I said, things like guardianship, supported decision making agreements. When it comes down to it, it's kind of like that old saying, you know, it takes a village and, and the village is a lot more tip, typically than just someone like Allison and someone like myself when you have a special needs child. But these two things combine so readily that it really is best if you have an advisor, you're working with someone like Allison, involve them in the process because you can have open communication. And then as we're advising you about things like do in terms of a special needs trust, the financial advisor is there to say, okay, well, this is how much realistically is going to make sense to put in there. And if we're looking across the board holistically at your assets and the whole family, you know, how much and percentage wise to this child versus that child and taking into consideration all of those issues. Typically when working with an attorney on these things, you should be having highly in-depth conversations with that attorney. This is not a uh, email, you know, you, you schedule a consultation and they shoot you over an email with a piece of paper that says, fill in these things and then we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> it takes a lot of conversation to get to the heart of the issues and your family to put together that cohesive plan. And that that is a really big, important point of how Allison and myself, you know, financial advisors who focus on special needs and special needs attorneys, it really is a team effort to make sure that you're put in the best position and your children are put in the best position possible. One thing I'd like to comment on is when we're doing those future care cost estimates, I, I call it 
small, medium, and large. We do several. Like, so, because we have families that come to us and say, you know, we're not there yet, but we're still hopeful and optimistic. We want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. So, you know, what if my child needs full care? We have families that know that their child's going to need full care. What if they need some care? What if they live in a little tiny home near me and they have, you know, an assistant that checks in on them and things like that. So we're able to run those future care cost estimates with, um, you know, varying factors and also the family's preferences. Like if someone says, I know that I want my um, my child to live at XYZ place in the future, I have them on the waiting list, you know, um, and I know it's this much, then we can put that into the plan. And I did see a question in the chat box that was saying, um, you know, ABLE accounts, SSI, Medicaid waivers, what role can insurance play in funding long-term special needs and what type of insurance policies might be used? So, Clearly, a person can be affluent and can fund their special needs trust with their current assets. Many, many people use life insurance and typically permanent life insurance to mm -hmm. fund a special needs trust. And the point behind that is that keeps their assets nimble while they're alive for the 25 to 35 years that they might spend in retirement when they might need those assets. And it also ensures that the people will have enough money to fund the special needs trust because the special needs trust will be the beneficiary of the life insurance uh, policy. So that is a strong strategy and we definitely see that all the time. The other thing that I would say is it's not wise to consider that the, the Social Security Administration SSDI or SSI is going to be enough to fund your future, the future care of a, of a loved one. Right now, SSI is $9.43 a month if you're getting the full amount. If you're getting $6.29 a month and the kid is not working, it tells me that you need to submit a rent agreement to get that up to the $9.43. But the bottom line is $9.43 a month is not enough to live off of. And so we have to offset that. And then furthermore, when it comes to these Medicaid waivers, a lot of families think, well, if I just get a Medicaid waiver, then all of my issues are solved and it will pay for housing. Well, only some of the Medicaid waivers pay for housing. And oftentimes the Medicaid waiver that pays for housing, the place where you want your child to live doesn't take Medicaid waivers, they're private pay. And so there are a lot of um, uh, residential living situations across Texas that do take waivers. There are a lot of them that are working on being able to take waivers. Um, but I would say more often than not for the families that we work with, um, we see a lot of places that they would like to go that are simply private pay. And that's why it's so very important to plan. Veronica, do we have a question? Yes, we have several questions. The first one, it says, my son goes to college next year and uh, he's going to turn 18 later this year. Can someone guide me what document we need in terms of a power of attorney, be able to make a joint decision with our child and others? He's talking about um, mm -hmm. supported decision making or power attorney, Melissa? Yeah, so how perfectly that this slide pops right up as you ask this question, Allison um, and Veronica. So, Here's what I will say. Again, your personal circumstances, you want to have a private conversation with a personal attorney that is just directed at you. Generally speaking, when a child who does have special needs is about to turn 18, you are looking at one of two things. Either your child has enough capacity that they, when they turn 18, will be able to sign things like medical and financial powers of attorney, supported decision-making agreements that can help you to still be able to help your kids the way mostly that you had as they were younger. Um, but if it's not in that situation and your child at 18, doctors determine they don't really have that capacity, it may be necessary to get guardianship over that child. And if that is the case, generally speaking, pretty much anywhere across Texas, the best time to start that practice, that is to go about six months prior to start that. That doesn't necessarily mean every case takes six months, but you wanna give yourself plenty of lead time to get everything done that has to get done prior to that hearing that will take place 
right after, hopefully, if you get everything done well and in time, right after the 18th birthday. You can't have the hearing until after the 18th birthday because technically it's not necessary until after your child turns 18, but you're generally gonna be looking at one of those two things. Either your child is capable to signing powers of attorney and things of that nature, or if not, you might be looking at a need for a guardianship, but personal circumstances you would wanna discuss privately. Melissa, I think this is a perfect time uh, to insert that I think a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney is a fabulous document to have for all of your kids that go away to college. Yes. And since we're talking at right, about this right now, it is a fabulous time for you to consult your parents, any aging parents or grandparents or people that you love to make sure that they have those documents in place as well. It's really, really important to have these documents in place and not wait for the crisis to happen. It is a real mess when the crisis happens. So these documents um, are easy documents, the power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney to get in place. But, and I think of, there was a fire at Texas State. Um, there were some mental health crises during um, COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I, so basically without those documents in place, if they were to like take your child somewhere to a mental health facility, they won't even tell you where they took them. If no. you don't have these, they can't. If they're not being mean. Legally, they cannot. And so yeah. it is so important to have that. So I always just mention that because sometimes we, as parents, we just don't think about that. Like, like we don't think about it that way. You don't think about it as a parent and your child certainly is not thinking about it. And I, I tell this story a lot because you, you might think of the power of attorney. You need a HIPAA authorization for your child as well. That is one of the most important things in regards to what Allison was saying and that, you know, the doctors can't tell you, the school can't tell you that your child was taken somewhere without that. And, and like I say, you don't think about it necessarily as a parent with everything else going on, but your kids are certainly not until and it's a little of a, a bit of a silly situation, but I always kind of joke about it. When I was in college, I was young when I started college at 17. So the first time that I wanted my mom to make an appointment for me at 18, I did not want to make it myself because <laughs> I was a freshman in college. So that can happen. So it's just a good idea, like Allison said, to have everyone that is going off to college, simple powers of attorney, but make sure you have a HIPAA authorization along with it. Are we good for the next slide? So were there any other questions that you wanted to? There is a lot of questions, but I wanted to mention that the chat, uh, I just noticed that people couldn't put anything in the chat. Now, if you want to type in the chat, please do so. Uh, but we have some questions in the q and I'm going to ask the next one, um, guys. Are the qualified attorneys that will work with people on fees, I'm paying $5,000 for just the guardianship. This amount may be difficult for many. Mm -hmm. Fees, attorney fees. So I am never going to feign to talk about any attorney's specific fees or what any attorney should or can charge. What I will say is when it comes to fees, they are going to be dependent on several factors when it comes to working with an attorney. Truthfully, one of the biggest ones is where are you located? You know, working with an attorney in a big, you know, Austin, Houston, Dallas metro area, generally speaking, fees are going to be higher in those big cities. Um, but it also has to do with the expertise of the attorney. So it's one of those things that you just want to talk to your attorney about and get a feel for them. Um, a lot of attorneys, when it comes to things like estate planning and whatnot, do complimentary consultations. I'm not going to say everybody does, but we do um, here at our firm. Um, so that's something that we just walk through when someone contacts us. And, and I'm sure there are different circumstances for different people, but it's something to talk about with the attorney that you're meeting with. Do you want another question or we continue? Sure. We can take some uh, additional questions. Sure. Um, is It is common for the C. FP and an attorney to communicate, coordinate on planning for an individual. How would a parent or a guardian go about facilitating such collaboration to optimize the plan's effect effectiveness? Do you want to take this first, Allison? Or? Sure. I mean, we, we work collaboratively with attorneys all the time. In fact, I would say 
I mean, we provide, I would say that we provide referrals to, um, you know, estate planning attorneys for special needs 95% of the time, because what we find is that people either do not have documents in place or their documents are grossly outdated. And when I say grossly outdated, I believe in my heart of hearts that if you are a parent with a loved one with a disability, that you should have your legal documents reviewed. It doesn't mean you have to have them changed, but you should at least have them reviewed every three to five years because laws change, things change, people die, things change. And it's crazy some of the things that I've seen where the documents have sit on the shelf for 15 years and um, and things like that. So it is really, really important. But yes, uh, we work very closely. Um, we, we work um, closely with the attorney on the wording. Um, when, when they have the title of the special needs trust, we update all of the beneficiaries um, to that exact title. The wording matters when it comes to beneficiary designations. And it is really, really important for that not to be messed up. And I know, Melissa, you've seen that messed up before. Um, so we work very closely um, with that. And some of the things that we do are a little bit siloed because Melissa doesn't do what we do and I don't do what she does. Um, but when it comes to having those legal documents in place, those titles of those documents, getting those beneficiaries set up, the registration of accounts set up appropriately, uh, to the title of the special needs trust, if that's what we're doing, we work very, very closely on those items. Yeah. And one thing I would say too, is and it is going to depend on the circumstances, meaning it's going to depend on the financial advisor and the attorney, but the way that we particularly work with our clients is we are always willing and able to have your advisor as part of your meetings. If you choose to do that, we always do let you know up front, and it's something that all of you here should understand that when you work with an attorney, um, most people are kind of familiar with the terms attorney client privilege and confidentiality. And when you bring a third party, even if it's your financial advisor, into your meeting, you can be negating that. So there might not be confidentiality or privilege, but for a lot of people, having your financial advisor in the room as part of the conversation outweighs any concerns that you have about that confidentiality or privilege. So it's, it's a personal choice and who you feel comfortable working with and how close you are to an advisor. Um, but a lot of attorneys, especially ones that do focus in this area, are going to be willing to have you bring in your advisor if your advisor wants to be part of it. And, and I've worked with Allison a lot. I've worked with other advisors. Some advisors always want to be in the room. Some just kind of take it case by case. Some really don't want to be in the room. So it is something that you want to just talk to your advisor about and talk to your attorney about. But typically you're going to have a willingness because they know how important it is to work together. And if it's something that you feel more comfortable having your advisor, because that can be very, very helpful. I don't know if you experience this probably a lot, Allison, but I know when I'm going through information with clients, they might be able to tell me everything in the world about their family. You know, we could talk about their kids for hours upon hours. The minute we get to going through what you have asset wise, it's as though everybody has wiped their brain blank slate. They have no idea what's in retirement and what's in brokerage account. And those things really matter. So sometimes it's really helpful to have your advisor as part of your meeting, because if you've got an advisor you've been working with who knows, you know, this is the real estate they have this is how much is in brokerage and this is how much is in retirement. I know this is not what everyone does every day. So a lot of people go, I don't know, I get a statement from Charles Schwab and it's all on one thing. Your advisor can be very helpful in separ separating that out, which really does help to make the plan work as best as possible. So it's just and about it, communicating mm -hmm. what your wishes are and making sure that the people that you're choosing are willing to work together too. Sure. And I think it, it matters on the type of advisor you have. Some advisors simply manage money. They don't have any background in special needs. They aren't in the weeds with you. Do you have a kid that's going to live with you for the rest of your life? They're not in the weeds. And I would say, you know, we are in the weeds. We're in the weeds on all of that. Um, all of that information that is relevant um, for an estate planning attorney and your and your documents that they're setting up. Um, we we have all of that information. All of that information matters as it relates to the plan for the for your child in the future. So one person asked in the chat box, um, what about, you know, what do you think about downloading power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney? If somebody doesn't have this, I mean, I we mentioned in the beginning, I'm a fan of professional 
legal advice. Um, but say somebody is in a financial bind and they really can't afford attorney services. What do you think about downloading a power of attorney HIPAA release in healthcare power of attorney from the internet? So I think anyone would expect that my response would be, I wouldn't recommend it as a first choice, but I also understand that there can be pinches. You know, like you might have a situation where you're going in the hospital tomorrow and you need to have a power of attorney in place or something like that. Do you have to have an attorney to do a medical or a financial power of attorney? No, not technically. It's just that you need to make sure that you're executing it properly, that you're signing it appropriately with a notary or witnesses or whatnot. And the other thing is you want to be careful where you're pulling from, because if you just kind of Google healthcare power of attorney, you might end up signing a power of attorney that's actually like a Minnesota medical power of attorney, which is very different than a Texas power of attorney. So you don't want to just Google anything if you're doing it. Um, Disability Rights Texas would be a good place to go as a resource as well um, if you're in a pinch, um, but there, or you know, other nonprofits that you might be part of as an advocacy you know, group. But as a general rule, if you're really looking at making sure that everything is done appropriately, you wanna sit down and talk to an attorney who can advise you appropriately and make sure everything is done accurately. And for the Google searchers out there, if you type <laughs> in like low income, legal aid like in your city they should um so disability rights texas is one for texans but there are many other legal aid programs um across the state and you could type in your county and it will tell you which ones are available in your county so you can look that up um as well there are a couple of counties and i i can never remember the other county um I know Galveston County has free guardianship. If you live in Galveston County, you can't just go there and get your guardianship. Um, here, but there here is- in Austin, there is another resource, the, the Capital Arc, the Arc of Capital Texas that help with guardianship, but it's not free. You have to go yeah. to their program, depending mm -hmm. on your income and stuff, they help you with certain fees. But uh, if you live in Austin, I can send you that information for, uh, for Travis County. The other thing I would say too, not necessarily about ARC, but look at your benefits through work. Now, not every attorney is going to be part of those services. Like I will be frank, our office does not work with those insurance providers, but it's an option. So, you know, look at, you know, your healthcare and you've got, you know, life insurance at work. Do you have a legal provider at work? And then you can always go there as well. Um, so it, those are all options that you can look at. And we're happy. Sometimes people, you know, like I, a lot of the oil and gas companies have those legal plans and we, you know, we're happy to look at that list and make a recommendation if we know that there is one on there that we know is great. Um, a lot of times um, the ones that we tend to typically refer to are not on that list, mm -hmm. um, but that is worth checking out. And this is kind of open enrollment season right now, too. So you may want to be looking at that. So if you're on here and you're about to do open enrollment with your benefits at work and they have a legal plan, most of those legal plans will give you a free will in the, in the documents that go along with the will. So if you're sitting on here and you don't have a will, which I can tell you a large percentage of the participants that are here today either don't have a will or have an outdated will because that's just what we know. We know what we do, right? Um, and the point is, is you're not alone, but look at that and it might be worth it for you to, to elect that benefit uh, this year. So I did see another question, Veronica, about, you know, do we help um, with SSI issues? Um, we do, and that's an offline, um, an offline topic. It just depends on how deep and wide the issue is on whether or not we would refer out to an attorney. We do have a specific attorney that we work very closely with, um, with major issues with the Social Security Administration. Um, if the Social Security Administration is just being slow and it's been taking over a year to get your SSI approved, uh, yeah, that's Texas. That's what's happening in Texas right now. Um, so you are not alone, but happy to chat with you uh, on uh, offline on that to see what direction might be the best direction for you to take with that. And Veronica, also, Alison, you recommend, all, you have a list of attorneys, right? Because in the chat, we have uh, someone asking for attorneys in Collin County. That's Dallas. Yes, we do. We do have an attorney list. And we also have um, 
We've also done webinars with uh, several attorneys in the Dallas Fort Worth, um, Dallas County, um, Collin County up there. So you can check those out on the uh, Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel and, um, and, and kind of see the different ones that we've worked with up there because those are the ones that we tend to refer to. Um, any additional questions, Veronica? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, we have another one. If, um, well, a little bit confused. Is it for a child? We will need health care power of attorney additionally. Additionally, to. So I think. I'm not sure. I, I don't know. The they're just asking if they need one, and that depends on whether or not they need to get a guardianship or not. If you do not need a guardianship because your child has the capacity to sign powers of attorney, then yes, you want to have a healthcare power of attorney. You want to have a financial power of attorney. You want to have a HIPAA authorization. But if you're getting guardianship that supersedes any powers of attorney, you're not going to have powers of attorney when you have guardianship. Another one, do you have an attorney list for Oklahoma? I don't, but what I would say is the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys and then yes. um, the, the Special Needs Planning Academy are both, so the Elder Law Attorneys, Special Needs Planning Academy are both good places to find those attorneys in any state. And the Special Needs Planning Academy, this will answer the other question, will be a good place to find advisors that are nuanced with special needs as well. The other place I would say that you can look if you're in another state is if you go to www.nelf.org. Uh, that is the organization that board certifies certified elder law attorneys. So if you want to look specifically for a certified elder law attorney, you can go to that website and you can find an attorney. I think there's at least one in every state that you can go and find. Um, we do have an off topic question about, um, you know, charter schools or public schools, um, because some, of, that. some Please, of the private. Um, and yeah, the it, it doesn't have the name who, who asked that question. Please. Um, in my email, region13prn at gmail.com, send that question to us and we can help you. I think the person is in the Houston area. Uh, but yes, we can help with that. Yeah, and, and I was going to say the same that, you know, Partners Resource does help with those types of things. And private school can get pretty expensive, um, as expensive as, as colleges or private colleges. So that um, can be an issue but finding the right fit is um, important, important. But the child is eligible for a free public education so if the public school is not meeting the child's need i have seen the private school be paid for by the district uh, in several ca cases but there's a lot of good options out there so um we have another one is we have lots of them out here so if if you have an adult child who live out of state and you think that they might one day become a guardian of their special needs younger sibling, should you still start the process now in Texas before figuring out the long-term plans? What do you say to families with children who live across the country? We're in our 50s and 60s, and our adult child children are in their 20s. The child with special needs is 16. Uh, so I'm gonna try to make some assumptions about question that's being asked. If you do not have guardianship over your child and you think that there is a need for guardianship over your child, it is best that you get that before you expect for a sibling of your child to take that over in the future. Um, it will be easier for a sibling or anyone else to take over if the guardianship is already in place. If you already have a guardianship in place, then practically speaking, the best thing that you can do is make sure that your estate planning is up to date and that you have what is essentially a declaration of guardian for the child that you have guardianship over. If you are the parent and the guardian of an individual, you do have the right to give the court kind of your preferences when something happens to you, who the next in line guardian would be. That doesn't mean that they necessarily have to act as guardian, 
So the best advice that I always offer is have those conversations with your family, especially when dealing with siblings, make sure it's something that they are willing and able to take on. You don't technically have to have a guardian in Texas just because the individual is in Texas, but there are some circumstances where that works out really well as a sibling having guardianship. There are others where it doesn't. And, and I always say that I know Allison and I have had this conversation many, many times. And if your kids are younger, I think Allison and I are totally on the same page and saying, you know, we don't really suggest having your kids act as guardian uh, for their siblings. But as they get older, that can change. I always tell, I have one of my paralegals has been her sister's guardian for over 40 years now, and you would have to pry that guardianship out of her cold, dead hands is how she feels about it. Um, if that's the case, then you want to know that in advance. And if it's not the case, you also want to know that in advance so that you're putting in place kind of who the best people are going to be. But it's nothing that you need to really do with the court right away. Maybe eventually it might be a good idea as you age to have those conversations with your children and see if it starts to become a good idea to transition away from you being the guardian while you still have your full capacity so that you can kind of make that transition a little bit more smooth than, you know, God forbid you're the guardian, you know, you pass away and your kids are dealing with all of these other things and this on top of it, or you become incapacitated, you know, we all age, you know, maybe, I'm guardian for someone. And then as I get older, suddenly I'm dealing with dementia. And now my kids are dealing with not only me, but taking guardianship for my other child as well. So those are just things to think about with your family and find the best time to make that transition. And Melissa, they for co-guardians in Texas, they're typically spouses. Some states offer, um, allow co-guardians that are not married couples. Like for instance, it was my sister-in-law and her sister were co-guardians of my niece, mm -hmm. um, but they were not in the state. So different states have different guidelines um, on that, but Texas doesn't do that. Is that correct? No, Texas will only appoint uh, spouses as co-guardian. And generally speaking, they're only gonna appoint the parents who are spouses as a co-guardian of the person. Um, of the individual. So typically you're not gonna see anyone other than the parents as co-guardians of the individual. So bottom line, and I know that we're um, running out of time for today, but from a perspective of um, what you do, legal documents, wills, healthcare power of attorney, power of, power of attorney, trust, all different types of trust, but special needs trust, help people with guardianship. So they're broad um a broad array of of things that you help families with but it's kind of a a process it's not just a special needs trust and the wills are very very important um and you know a lot of times people talk about ranges of you know what does this look like um can you can you pr provide a range i know it's not i know it's not specific to um you know you or whatever and you can't you know state the fees for for other attorneys but if a person's trying to plan financially of how much they might need to set aside if they're looking to get their wills and special needs trust their their those documents set up is there a range that um that a person maybe should consider setting aside um, I would say, of course, it's going to depend on, you know, if you're a single individual or a married couple, but I would be, I would be considering that you're probably going to be looking if you're working with a qualified attorney, anywhere between starting around 2,500 to 3,000, anywhere up to 10, 11, it just kind of depends on what kind of planning, you know, are we talking general estate planning, wills, trusts? and separate special needs trust. Can we just do what we refer to as a testamentary special needs trust into your, your actual will, your actual revocable living trust? So like I said earlier, every family is different, but you are gonna be looking at with most attorneys who are highly specialized in this, pretty much anywhere across Texas, you're gonna be looking at several thousand dollars as a starting point. And we have somebody, Allison and Melissa, thanks for the presentation, very helpful. Have you worked together on behalf of mutual Houston-based clients? We've worked with clients across the state of Texas. I know um, Melissa's in Austin 
and I am in the greater Houston area, um, but we actually serve clients all throughout the US, not just in Texas. Um, so for today, um, I want to just hit on a couple of things. We've had this slide up for a while, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, we always talk about the things that you should keep on your special needs planning radar. Um, and we've talked, we've kind of scratched the surface on a few of those things, but we have entire webinars dedic dedicated to the entire topic of, of Medicaid waivers, SSI, SSDI, ABLE accounts, special needs trust. Um, we've done a lot of what I call speed dating housing um, webinars where we have a lot of the residential living um, places that come on and in about five minutes there, there might be 10 or 15 on in the, in the hour and they'll tell us who what where when why how much do they take waivers do they have openings who do they serve um so if you're looking for future um housing or residential options uh, that's a good place we have lots of those webinars on the on the youtube channel and what I would say is I'm not saying, oh, how can we find a place for your child to live? That is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that you might not feel as young and spry as you do right now, 20 years from now. You may not have the caregiving ability that you once had 20 years from now. Being aware of what these re residential options are, where are they? What is their availability? And getting yourself on these lists. Some of these waiting lists are five years. Um, giving yourself the ability to say no, as opposed to needing some place for your loved one to go and having nowhere for them to go. So I am definitely a fan of looking at, at those things. And I'm really a fan, of the, when you start touring these, they're awesome. And you'll see that the, the, re, the residents there, they love it. They're happy, they have community, they have friends, they have purpose, a lot of them have jobs. And so much so that when the families that we serve, their kids come home for the weekend or they go to visit, they're asking them, when do I get to go back or when are you leaving? <laughs> because they like it. And so there is some balance in having autonomy from us as parents a little bit. And then maybe, you know, some of your retirement looks like it. The other thing that I would say on that on housing is don't wait until you're 80 years old and the child's lived with you forever and ever and they've known no other way and then you pass away, they are like a fish out of water going to these places. These places have summer camps, they have transition programs, there's like ways that you can dip your toe in and check it out without going to live there right now. And sprinkling that throughout your transition journey is going to be really, really important. So um, we've got entire webinars on guardianship and alternatives to guardianship in, in Texas. It's the least restrictive, most appropriate. And so that's where they start talking about some of the alternatives, such as some of the things that Melissa was talking about earlier, supported decision-making agreement, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, things like that. And we have entire webinars on post high school educational options. Uh, for kids with disabilities. And yes, that's right. There are many, many, many options for kids, including kids with learning disabilities with IQ below 70. There's lots of programs out there. So definitely check that out. So um, today, everybody's going to get a copy of our slides today um, with all of our information and our links. This link right here will have our upcoming webinars that you can subscribe to or um, sign up for if it's a topic that's relevant to the journey that you're on. Um, we work on a collaborative team here at CPG, so I always like to say that because if you see my face, Michelle often does webinars with us as well, um, but we do work on a team here as well. And right here on the screen, we've got all of our contact information. Again, you guys are going to get a copy of these slides. Reach out to Melissa at Texas Trust Law if you've got questions, legal questions, you need help with your documents, the special needs trust, you need you know, ha to have deep conversations, definitely reach out, schedule your free consultation. We offer free consultations as well. Take a deeper dive, any of the questions that we weren't able to answer today or any questions that were really specific, um, specifically relevant to your loved one, um, definitely reach out. This QR code here will take you to a calendar where you can schedule your free consultation. Um, Veronica, do we have any additional questions before we um, wrap up for today? Sure. I think I, we just missed two of those questions. It says, if C 
CLA certification is a good credential to look for in an attorney specializing in special needs planning. What certification should we look for to find special needs specialists in financial planning? So certification. So I would I would say, I, I think we did talk about that a little bit. You can look at the um, Academy of Special Needs Planners. There's, um, they're out there. Um, we're nationally certified as social security advisors. That's one of the certifications that we have uh, that kind of take a deeper dive into the social security aspect of things. I don't know if you have anything else that you want to add. The, the certified financial planner board does not necessarily mean that they're, they're nuanced and special needs. So a person could be a certified financial planner and have zero background in special needs. So that is one concern, I would say. Yeah, no, I would agree with Allison. I think if you're looking at places like the Academy of Special Needs Planners, that's your best bet. Um, and then kind of just going back to it, being a certified elder law attorney is a good first step. Not all certified elder law attorneys are going to focus so heavily on dealing with the younger side of special needs planning, but it is a great place to start because most do kind of the whole spectrum. Um, but I would agree with Allison. These, the Academy of Special Needs Planners is a great place to start for financial advisors. For sure. Well, thank you, everyone. It's certainly been our pleasure being here uh, with you today. Great to be back with Melissa again and Veronica. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you so much, guys. It's a pleasure thank as you. always. And you are going to receive an email today with the handouts and uh, later on with the, with the recording too. Thank you so much. Thank you.